is a cybersecurity job. Everybody's talking about it. Cybersecurity. 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 Cybersecurity and cyber attacks around the world. It's the hot new trendy tech thing. Is it still trending? Of course it is. The internet isn't going anywhere and the bad guys still want your money. Evil! But it's confusing. I, just like a lot of you, went to college for cybersecurity thinking I'm going to secure stuff. But what stuff? This stuff? This too? What about this? There's so many different things that need securing, you can't just learn how to secure it all. We're all just trying to find a job that pays for our hobbies. We can't spend every waking moment of our life learning. Ain't nobody got time for that! So if you want to save yourself from learning purgatory, then follow along. You might just finally pick your cybersecurity niche. Like, right now. Today. I'll provide the different cybersecurity paths or niches down below in the description. So if you'd like to skip ahead to the something that you're more interested in, feel free. This is the beginning of the rest of your life so choose wisely <sighs> let's get started so cybersecurity niches or paths can be broken down into these 11 domains conveniently created and curated by Henry Jong are you scared good you should be cybersecurity is scary and why these 11 well because it makes sense and as Henry himself states he only included the domains that are most prevalent and comprehensive for general cybersecurity practices. So generally speaking, these are the general paths that you can take into cybersecurity. Now I was going to cover job titles, also known as job roles, also known as those things that HR will randomly name with no regard to the English language. But nobody respects the English language, not even native English speakers. Oh look! A job for security engineer? Oh wait, what's this? Tickets? Support? Phone calls? Uh, hold up! Wait a minute. Don't get too stuck on job titles. The titles are meaningless. One company's security engineer is another company's help desk. Just focus on the type of work that you wanna do. And once you start applying for these jobs, just pay attention to the actual job responsibilities in the job description. Now, after we go over the cybersecurity paths, I'll go over a certification roadmap to get you started on the right path of your choice. With that being said, let's dive into the first cybersecurity path. Physical security. Do you love the gym? <laughs> That's nice, I do too, but that's not what this is. This category covers all Internet of Things, IoT devices, or what I like to call dumb devices. Your fridge, your toaster, your smartwatch, your car, your Tesla might be listening to your conversations. We are more dependent on IoT devices than ever before, and I don't think many people realize just how dependent we truly are. Streetlights, agriculture, cities, industrial plants, warehouses, all rely on IoT devices. What's an IoT device? Well, loosely defined, it's a physical device that is connected to the network and is capable of collecting collecting, sending, and receiving data. So who creates and secures these IoT devices? Well, an IoT security specialist. That could be you. Physical security also encompasses the always important and often overlooked need for safeguarding physical assets on a company premise. Now, IoT devices fits perfectly here because they can protect physical assets. Tools such as infrared alarms, RFID badge readers, and everything else can all help protect your stuff. We need IoT devices to protect our stuff. We also need to make sure those IoT devices don't open us up to some big gaping holes. Because all the fancy security tools in the world are no match for someone walking into your server room and plugging in a USB device into a server rack. Now this path can be branched off into one of two ways. You can embrace all things coding, and go into embedded software security, or you can just know the gist of how to design and implement security best practices to protect all the physical devices from intrusion and tampering. And the second route is more design than it is technical coding. And even further into the weeds, we have industrial control systems, where you have to learn the in and outs of SCADA, Ooh. or whatever other system they use to monitor and control what are essentially many IoT devices known as programmable ah. logic controllers that are incredibly important and if hacked could cause catastrophic damage that could take out the entire grid and bring civilization down to a screaming halt. Well, we're just banking on all these IoT devices being air-gapped and not piquing too much interest on the cyber black market. So yeah, you could become somewhat of an ICS security architect if you wanted to. Which brings us to security architecture. Also can be called security engineers. Now this path is further broken down into many, many, many different technologies. Just like you need many ingredients to create a delicious bowl of tonkatsu ramen, cybersecurity needs many different tools combined to create a properly secured environment. Or if you like the traditional metaphor, security is kind of like an onion. They stink? Yes. No. Oh, they make you crap. No! 
Layers! You need many layers of defense. And each of these many, many different tools needs someone to specialize in them. Cloud! This is blowing up in our faces. Since having everything kept off-premise is bringing more risk to the company, but man, do they make it easier and substantially more affordable for businesses to ditch the old on-premise server setups. Storing critical data on servers you have no control over means that that place better have some good security engineers configuring their servers and software to protect your data. This can be you. You can basically focus on any one of the big cloud giants, AWS, Azure, and of course, Google. And you'll be sure to find plenty of well-paying jobs. Networking. This is an obvious path to take, and it's not as hip and new as cloud, but without it, we don't have the internet. This space is largely dominated by Cisco, but there are many up and coming new players in the field making a solid name for themselves, like Juniper, Fortinet, and Palo Alto. You need to know networking intimately and pretty much every cyber path you're going to take, this one just hyper-focuses on the space, and you become an expert in one or maybe more of the commonly found networking device brands, protocols, and proprietary networking language. You'll always have a job somewhere fixing closets like this. Cryptography. Do you love math? I don't. I made the mistake of trying to minor in mathematics in my four year degree, but Calc 4 knocked some sense into me. But hey, if you like staring at equations, cryptography might be right up your alley. As a cryptologist, not only do you get to stare at equations all day, but you get to try and break them. Cryptology is needed to keep data in motion and at rest secure. Think of the cyber path as a cyber locksmith. You know how to make the locks and you know how to break the locks. What happens when someone is able to break the encrypted data and exfiltrate private trade secrets? Well, you get our next cybersecurity path, data protection. This path is all about data loss prevention. This is a step back from the full-fledged crypto analysis experts to the bigger picture of data security. How does data come in and out of an environment and where could any possible data exfiltration occur? Forensics, also known as data recovery. The difference between data protection and data recovery being someone who knows how to keep data protected versus someone who knows how to dig up a lot of data in many different ways. This could be in the form of OSINT, social engineering, and of course, the always fun data recovery from broken hard drives, phones, computers, you name it. Do you wanna be the next cyber Sherlock Holmes? Well, cyber forensics is for you. Another much needed tech tool that we use is virtualization, which is often referred to as containerization. Think Kubernetes, Docker, AWS, and Azure. My bachelor's degree had one class that was solely focused on virtualization, and for good reason. This tech allows you to spin up a virtualized operating system that is fully enclosed and secured, hopefully, and these environments allow you to allocate however much resources you need to them, as far as CPU and memory goes, that you need. So it's very scalable to have virtualization in place in your environment. But this tech is complicated, and securing it is even more complicated. Now, despite Encabulation's unparalleled success in reducing sinusoidal depleneration through advanced dingle alarm technology, it has failed to meet the unanticipated needs of the cybersecurity industry. My senior capstone project had me and a couple other guys develop and code a honeypot that would get spun up via Kubernetes from a student webpage that we also had to make that simulated traffic and pumped that traffic into an elk stack that we also had to make. So like any other good senior students, we did nothing for the entire three quarters and grabbed a pre-made honeypot off of GitHub that looked impressive. I still don't know how to use Kubernetes. It's hard. And for that reason, it's one of many virtualized platforms Platforms that need specialists. Access control. This is the gatekeeper to access all of the tools and all of the things. We have an identity access management team at my current job, which consists of approving, denying, and setting up access to essentially anything on the network. You want to log into your computer? IAM. You want to access that folder, that security tool, the break room? IAM. Now this also branches off into MFA SSO, multi-factor authentication and single sign-ons, federated identity, which is just accessing multiple sites with a single sign-on because people are lazy and can't remember more than one password. What's my password? <laughs> if you like to grant access or more satisfying, deny it. Access denied Then study up on access management on both Active Directory on-premise and of course, Active Directory in the cloud, because cloud access management is the wave of the future. Maybe this means that IAM is morphing into cloud security? Hmm. 
A couple special mentions in security architecture and engineering is secure system builds. This can be loosely defined as endpoint security. You specialize in hardening endpoints with security tools like EDR, which is endpoint detection and response, and make sure that all the endpoints are designed with network segmentation in mind. So in a way you influence how the topology map of a business or network is made and making sure that all these endpoints in the topology are deployed with solid secure by default configurations and baselines. All of course, while ensuring that updates are tested and apply to the endpoints without affecting day-to-day -day work. You're the endpoint shepherd. And all the endpoints are your sheep. This further leads into the weeds of endpoint security. You need to know operating systems like the back of your hand. CrowdStrike is an example of an endpoint security tool that requires security architects to successfully deploy and maintain. The people who make CrowdStrike and all of its proprietary AI software are considered some type of security engineers in this mess of cybersecurity paths that we're in, which also is a path that you could choose. Where there are security architects that deploy tools, there are security engineers and secure software engineers that help make the tools. Now, without getting too far into the weeds with all the different tools that exist, EDRs, SIMs, firewalls, IDS, IPS, WAFs, the list goes on and they all require security engineers to help maintain and build them. Any one tool can potentially require someone whose sole purpose is knowing how to use the tool and implement it. This could mean either working for a company that uses the tool or for the company that makes the tool. You're Tim the Cyber Tool Man Taylor. <laughs> Sorry, I like analogies. Career development. This is the path of the teacher. And just like the saying goes, it takes a special type of person to be a teacher. They have to be certified mad. I feel like the path of the teacher is pretty self-explanatory. It's no different than any other spaces. You just have to become knowledgeable in any one of the aforementioned niches and you can start teaching other people how you learned what you learned. All these institutions that offer certifications offer some form of career development. Do you wanna create a course that offers a sweet certificate at the end that hiring managers will drool over and hire someone in instantly if they have it. I sure do, but I'm crazy like that. There's also university, college, boot camps, and heck, even high school probably has some cybersecurity classes that you could become a teacher for, given how popular cybersecurity is getting. So yes, you too can become a cyber teacher if you like teaching. Frameworks and standards, not auditing actually. This is being part of the team that actually creates the frameworks themselves. The rules. Some of the most popular frameworks that regularly need updating and tuning and changing as the cyber world evolves and new threats emerge are NIST, ISO, OWASP, MITRE, PCI DSS, HIPAA, and GDPR, just to name a few of the major players. So do you like making rules? Well, here you go. One of the worst things I've ever had to do in any of my jobs, my current security analyst role and my last two help desk jobs, was documentation. <laughs> Writing the dreaded SOPs. Ugh. If you like endless documentation, by all means, this path can be for you. Naturally, the sibling to frameworks is our next niche, governance. Do you like easy money and hate excitement? Well, boy, it's your lucky day. Governance is arguably less boring while still retaining a good level of boring from the frameworks path. Here we have people who make sure that companies and businesses are following the rules that they need to be following. I don't think anyone loves being audited. It's like a universal hatred. Why? Because businesses try to cut corners wherever possible to retain the bottom line. Money. So you might find that governance has its moments where interactions with businesses get a little spicy, a little mucho caliente. It seems my antiperspirant has failed. So if you want a little spice in your life, after learning all about the frameworks, you can pivot your way into a governance role. This path encompasses everything from internal auditor all the way to external auditor. Bottom line is you know all about the cyber rules, like the back of your hand. Captain Audit. Da 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 da. Enterprise risk management. This is big business corporate that requires a specialized person who knows all the ins and outs of business. Think business continuity plans, disaster recovery plans, crisis management, cyber insurance, audits that big businesses need. No, you don't perform the audit yourself, but you will facilitate and initiate these audits. This kind of encompasses a bit of governance, but requires additional understanding of corporate environments and all of its intricacies. For example, a small business might need to be PCI DSS compliant, but they probably don't need software one and SOC 2 audits. The point of an enterprise risk management specialist is to know how to ensure all the assets in a company are accounted for and protected using the least amount of security necessary. Now, I picked up that phrase from a video I watched while studying for the CISSP. It sounds shady as hell, but makes sense if you think about it. A business shouldn't be spending more than absolutely necessary in security because any quote unquote extra budget spent towards any cybersecurity tools, cyber insurance, employees, what have you, that is not necessary is just wasted money. And man, do corporate executives hate when they see wasted money. Application security. This is very coding heavy, very heavy. So heavy, in fact, that it can be arguably 
considered a coding job more than a security job. But it's considered cybersecurity, as you don't always need to know how to code the entire software, but just know enough to know how the bad guys are going to break it. <laughs> you need to secure stuff like APIs, source code, CI, CD, which is continuous integration and continuous delivery, a fancy term that just means that software is constantly updated and patched. These updates can often bring new vulnerabilities into the software, or the patch itself has vulnerabilities in it. Think software security life cycles and data flow diagrams. You're responsible for securing whatever code the software engineers who think they're better than you because they know what a hash map is, is secure and without gaping vulnerabilities. Threat intelligence. This is kind of like becoming a cyber research specialist. In my current job, we have people whose primary role is threat intelligence or all of their day-to-day -day work. There's tons of threat intelligence companies like FireEye, CrowdStrike, Kaspersky, Threat Intelligence, and so many more. These are people that are doing the real fancy malware analysis. You know that advanced malware analysis that I have yet to release a video on? They specialize in keeping up with all of the APTs and IOCs. APTs are, of course, Advanced Persistent Threats, which are usually state actors, which is, again, another fancy word for government. And IOCs is indicators of compromise, which are just any artifacts that can indicate that malware is in your environment. This is important for obvious reasons. If we don't have people looking for the new malware, viruses, phishing campaigns, and social engineering tactics being used in a business, then people cannot properly protect against them proactively. Can't just rely on AI yet, Elon. It's not ready. User education. I applied to a phishing awareness training specialist at Costco, and I got ghosted, much to my surprise because I thought my mad training skills resume would have piqued their interest. This is somewhat what it sounds like. Businesses need people to facilitate employee educational programs on proper cybersecurity practices. After all, the weakest link in any business is always going to be people. So naturally investing time in all your st employees on the dangers of downloading that random font that they desperately need, or click on that link that's clearly bad, Sharon, is very much needed. So this is a much less technical path to take, but still requires a solid understanding of security principles and all the potential avenues a bad guy might take to break into your company and steal the precious business data and sell it on the black market. I saved the two most well-known cybersecurity paths for last. Risk assessment, which is generally known as ethical hacking or red teaming, and security operations or blue teaming. Red teaming is the most popular and probably the most sought after job in all of these cybersecurity paths due to how exciting and frankly overhyped it is. Penetration testing is what most people think red teaming is and it kind of pretty much sums up the role in a nutshell. In this path, you are an expert at breaking into things, both virtually and physically, like actual lock picking on premise through physical doors. Correct. I'm invincible. I can't even say invincible and testing the effectiveness of surveillance and alarms. They also test how effective user education is by lying to their face or over the phone and glean whatever information they can to access secure data or secure office facilities or rooms or server rooms. This path includes more than just the exciting on-premise penetration testing. It also encompasses vulnerability scanning and risk assessment that don't involve attempting to break in using any means necessary. The point of this path is to be able to locate and identify any vulnerability that can be exploited by a bad guy and make sure that it is properly fixed. That when the real bad guys are knocking at the door, the blue team sees it, take action, and stop them in their tracks. Which brings us to blue teaming, security operations. This is the position I'm currently in as a security analyst working for the incident response team. The most commonly known blue team job is the security operations center analyst, usually split into SOC level one, two, and three, with level one consisting of the junior analysts that will escalate anything that they can't handle or maybe require additional senior remediation to SOC level two and three. Blue teaming goes beyond incident response though. There's so much more to security operations that most beginners are unaware of. There's usually security development and automation teams mixed in. These teams ensure that the security tools that the incident response team use are functioning and provide access to everything that the IR team needs in order to complete their investigation and perform remediation. So security development, often referred to as SEC DevOps, will install and maintain the security tools such as EDR, SIM, and WAF tools, and any other security tool that the environment may need, and they're constantly patching and updating these tools. Automation is working with all the tools that the SEC DevOps team has put in place, and they integrate them into playbooks and run books into a security orchestration automation and response platform, otherwise known as SOAR, otherwise known as XSOAR for the new versions. And these SOAR platforms will be used to run scripts and automate and streamline investigations. You want to network contain an endpoint? The automation team will create a button that will run a script through the SOAR platform that will then network quarantine the device either through the SOAR platform itself, if it supports that, 
or through, say, CrowdStrike as an integration since CrowdStrike supports network quarantining. This allows the incident response team to be that much quicker with their response time. And in IR, the name of the game is time. The faster that you can contain a breach, the better your odds are at reducing the damages to the business or the company. Security operations is just like the name implies, a large set of operations being performed by the security team to protect the company. So this can overlap with many of the different previously mentioned cyber paths, threat intel gathering, penetration testing, forensics, risk assessments, heck even IAM can all be part of the in-house security team. You also find that many of these cyber paths do cross. So while it's great to hyper-focus on one particular path, as you'll save time learning, you can always pivot into a different path and become more of a hybrid role that knows how to do multiple jobs. A perfect example of this is purple teaming, which of course is the color you get when you mix red and blue. As you might expect, someone who works for a purple team is someone who knows how to perform both blue team and red team and acts as a middleman between the two teams. Ideally, if there's enough communication and understanding between a blue team and a red team, there shouldn't be a need for an additional man in the middle. But if you ever worked in corporate, you'll know that the bigger the business, the more difficult it is to ensure that work gets done and gets done right. So think of a purple team role as a sort of manager or supervisor that ensures that the people driving in their specific cyber path niche are doing their jobs correctly since they have a better, broader understanding of the company needs since they know both sides of the coin. All right, so that's it for different cyber paths that you can do. How do I get started if I know what cyber path that I wanna get into? Well, foundation, roots, basics, whatever you wanna call it, is going to lay the groundwork for any path that you wanna take. This means a basic understanding of computers and networking, user accounts, programs, operating systems, processes, IP configurations, all that. Now this can be achieved through many different ways, self-learning through help desk experience, platforms like Try Hack Me or Hack the Box, boot camps, college, university, or certifications. Now I'm not gonna be able to tell you which is best for you since everybody's situation is different. Some people are obsessed with computers and can self-learn their way into a job no problem. Others can buckle down and study for certifications like no other and be able to actually understand the material, not just memorize answers. And others need a kick in the ass and need college to keep them on the learning path. The fastest way to any job in the cyber field is certification, hands down. What certifications can I do to get into each of these paths? This is the last certification map that you'll ever need. And if you want to see it, please subscribe as I'll be covering it in this cyber path series. I hope this was helpful in clearing up some of the confusion on the umbrella term that is cybersecurity.